Hello everyone, Kent Bressler here. I want to welcome you to Kent's Kidney Stories. During our time together um, over these podcasts, I'd like to uh, discuss kidney disease. I'd like to tell you about my journey as a transplant patient, but also talk about dialysis, kidney donation, and just about anything else that might be of interest. Kent's Kidney Stories podcast endorsed and sponsored by kidneysolutions.org. Hello, everybody. This is Kent Bressler, Kent's Kidney Stories. And uh, guess what we're going to do now? We're going to do some podcasting. And stick around till I get through my diatribe because I want you to meet a really, really good friend of mine who is uh, most certainly learned in the kidney community. And uh, he's going to pass on some some jewels to us that I think you're going to find it's worth listening to. So we, you know how we start this. We always do it with, with a prayer. So here we go. Heavenly Father, each day is a struggle against sin and the temptation. Give us the strength to overcome cruelty with grace and hatred with love. Dear God, remind us that our actions matter. We do not fight a physical battle, but a spiritual one. And with each act of compassion, we build your kingdom. Help us to be kingdom builders today. We ask this in your name, our heavenly father. Amen. So peace and understanding are not always easy to come by when we have chronic illness and why do I feel so bad becomes a question. Why do I have to deal with this kidney disease? Why is it that none of these medicines are working? These and many other questions are in common conversations among people who have kidney disease. The word is that everyone is different. And I guess that's true. But one thing that is a given is the fact that most everyone needs a mentor, someone they can talk with, someone who's been through it. I like to think we can offer that to you. If you're struggling with kidney disease right now, or you know somebody who is, and you need someone to listen, contact us at kidneysolutions.org. Sign up for our Monday night support groups or listen to a podcast, or better yet, read some of our great blogs. Who knows? It might help. Another good source of mentorship is AAKP, the American Association of Kidney Patients. As the oldest and the largest independent kidney patient organization in the United States, AAKP is dedicated to improving the lives and long-term outcomes of kidney patients using and through education, advocacy, patient education and engagement, and the fostering of patient communities. AAKP fights for early disease detection, the appropriate diagnosis of rare genetic conditions, increased kidney transplantation, and preemptive transplantation. Full patient choice of either in center or home dialysis, protection of the patient physician relationship, promotion of research and innovation, including artificial implantable and wearable kidneys, and most importantly, the elimination of barriers for patient access to available treatment options. Now, There is a great segue to the introduction of today's guest on Kent's Kidney Stories. Paul Conway is a great friend. He's an advocate and fellow transplant recipient who is the chair of policy and global affairs and the immediate past president of the American Association of Kidney Patients. He's a policy and communications professional with several decades of experience in White House and cabinet level 
policy. If you want to read about this guy's many posts and accomplish, accomplishments, please go to AAKP because they're way too long for me to read here. Hello, Paul, and welcome, my friend, to Ken's Kidney Stories. Hey, Ken, thank you very much, and uh, thanks for such a great opening prayer. Uh, it kind of brings it to the core of uh, what we're called to do, those of us who are fortunate to live, and the two of us have great experiences in being able to not only manage disease, but teach people how to endure and uh, live for a long time with it. So uh, you started us right, and I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, as far as my bio, my mother was right. She would always say as, a, as an Irish Catholic mom, I hope to hell you can keep a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I would always laugh, take it real seriously, and know that I had to stay in the arena. Otherwise, she'd come find me. <laughs> exactly. They have good moms have a, a, a tendency to do that, don't they, Paul? <laughs> <You bet>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I got to read and I thought, I'm not going to do this. People want to read it. They need to go and because you know what? You've had a, some, a tremendous career in the kidney field, right? Uh, so the like first. The first thing that, that really struck me was the fact that you've been transplanted for a long time. So give us an idea about your kidney journey. Sure. So right off the top, on May 8th uh, of this year, I will celebrate uh, 25 years with a kidney transplant. But it all began when I was uh, 16. I was uh, living on the coast of Maine. My parents had retired from Washington, D.C. to Maine. And I was getting my sports physical at 16. And at that point in time, I was very well organized. I had a big goal, and that was to go to one of the service academies. I wanted to go to Annapolis. Um, my grandfather had been in the military. My father had been in the military. And I was doing all the right things, sports, you know, engagement in the community, little town of 6,000 people, go to the doctor. And uh, I lucked out because my primary care physician happened to have been a gentleman that was a uh, flight surgeon for the Royal Air Force who had been recruited to the United States for the NASA program. And he was involved with the SR-71 and the Apollo program. And then when he retired out from that, he saw an ad in the newspaper and wanted to go to a small town, kind of like England, moved to this small town in Maine where I was. So I'm doing my sports physical and he does something that he was not common. He did a blood test and a urine test in addition to the physical exam. And in that urine test, uh, which is low cost, um, he found uh, protein, in area, protein in the urine, and uh, kidney disease. And so I learned it when I was 16. He did that as a matter of course as a military doctor. Um, and I later found out that's quite unusual to screen people like that, but uh, I was lucky. And so with that diagnosis, I managed it for uh, 13 years and uh, tried to get a transplant preemptively, wasn't able to do that, and then did three years of uh, home dialysis, and uh, and I got transplanted. And um, my kidney came from a young 16-year-old boy uh, who was killed in a car accident several weeks after having gone to a high school assembly and heard from a kidney transplant recipient about the gift of life and organ donation. And he went home and he bugged his parents and they said no, I think one or two times. And then they said yes, they had to consent. Yeah. And several weeks after that, Ken, he was killed in a car accident and uh, he mm -hmm. lives to this day with me because I have his kidney. So and that's what you and that's what you call it, his kidney, don't you? I sure do. Every morning I get up, I uh I wonder what he would be doing today, uh, what kind of you know goals and aspirations he had for his life. And I remember the words of the surgeon who came up to see me uh, the next day after my transplant surgery. That was done at the Virginia Commonwealth University Medical College of Virginia. And Dr. Fisher came up and uh, stood at the foot of my bed and kind of woke me up a little bit groggy and then told me about what a beautiful organ it had been, um, the type of person it had come from, a young man who had never seen you know, a sports injury, no alcohol, no drugs, and he told me that it was my responsibility uh, to take care of that organ and to think about him every day. And uh, I, have, I have not failed to do that. I pray for him. I think about it. And I feel like he takes a journey with me every day we get up and go somewhere and try to do good for somebody else. Yeah. You know, that hits home with me. Two things that you said. First of all, finding out that you have uh, protein in your urine. And we've always said, you and I both just 
hammered this. Where is the where is the idea that you could screen? Well, there it is right there, and it's a five dollar test, right? You know, so Ken, what are we waiting on? You know, when you when you think about it, a lot of people like to talk about healthcare issues, and I know I'm kind of wonky sometimes, but let's just break it down to the most simple thing. People talk about healthcare costs, they're usually talking about end cost. End after after things have gone haywire. But what Kent and I are talking about right now is a $5 test, a urine screen that was done on me. And then I could, I could manage my disease. I knew how to maintain myself. But for most Americans, they don't, they're not screened. And half of them go on to dialysis from an emergency room. And it's a huge disruption in life. That's exactly right. And that's the point well taken there. People need to realize that 30 million people don't even realize they have this disease. Think how easy it would be. Every test used to be Medicare would cover. And every time you go in, you get a urine test. Doesn't happen that way anymore. So what's wrong with that picture? Well, That's what know, we're working on today, AKP, right? Yeah, well, I tell you what, we're, uh, all of us who have been blessed uh, to have another day of life uh, and a merry band are we. Uh, you're a crazy Texan down there. You've got your <laughs> podcast. You're reaching a lot of people. Uh, we work with AKP. You're on our board. We're all doing everything we can, all over in the water, to try to educate people that, uh, one, if you think you might uh, have a family history of it, get screened, get proactive. And the nice thing is, after all these years, Kent, we're getting some uh, therapeutics out there that can slow disease and make life better for you so you can manage it and, uh, and get on with life. Now, the, other sec the second thing I wanted to point out was the fact that that is not your kidney. A lot of people say my kidney, this and my kidney, that, but it's not, it's someone else's and you're honor bound to take care of not only yourself, but that kidney. I feel the same way about my brother's kidney. It's not mine. It's his, you know, and that's how time, I speak of it. First time I met you, Kent, you told me about your brother's kidney and I knew exactly what you were talking about um, because it, it's actually uh, not that typical that people will talk like that, I find. And uh, you got to honor your donor, whether you knew them or not. And, you know, some people are shy to talk about it, but the fact is that uh, I am here today because of the selfless act of a young person at 16 uh, who could envision a future where he could save a life. And think about that. Think about all the grief that people give young people in America today. And here's a young man that 25 years ago knew that he could make a difference in somebody's life after just listening to somebody like us. Yep. And he did it. Yep. And you with your brother, I mean, every time I've ever seen you and talked to you and heard you talk, you honor your brother. And it is a matter of honor. You it's, bet. It total, it's total honor. And we won't dwell on it, but I can tell you what, we wouldn't be here without those things. I guarantee okay. you, they can talk about longevity on dialysis all they want and the possibility of doing it. But I'm glad I took the route I did. All Me right. Too. So let's, uh, let's transition here just a little bit. Yeah. You know what? I got a feeling this could go on for a long time. We're, we're going <laughs> to, we can, you and my, me can get down some bunny trails and that's okay. We're not going to worry about that Paul. Okay. Uh, let's talk about AAKP because I know it's your second love other than your family and your, and your kidney. So tell me it's a well-oiled machine. I've been part of it for a good while and I enjoy it. Uh, just tell me uh, your great step. Just give me an overview of what it was like to be president of this organization. Sure. So it, it was an absolute honor. Uh, our organization was founded by six patients, as you well know. Yes, sir. Uh, who got together, and they did that in 1969. And so people today talk about patient engagement. Well, uh, this organization has been doing it for over 50 years. And so to be the president of it at an emotional level was deeply moving because I felt like I was honoring my donor in a way that you know, I never would have imagined 25 years ago, but uh, it's a huge responsibility. And because of my background in policy and politics and organizations, I thought probably one of the best things I could do is uh, to lay out a plan with uh, Richard Knight, our current president, some of the other board members, where we would have a strategy moving forward. And uh, that's what we did. We built the apparatus so it has a massive social media capacity, but just as importantly, capacities for press and email and those types of things. And then we actually set out to target areas of influence at the national level in terms of policy, in terms of research, and in terms of funding through Capitol Hill and to bring the patient voice to maximize um, advancements and in innovation for uh, other patients. 
people that will that that we'll never meet, but whose lives we're going to impact. Just right. like for us, they're behind. They're the ones that are we call coming from behind, that have no guidance, that were like us, and we're so glad we can help them out. Yeah. You know, the interesting thing about AAKP to me is your staff. Oh my gosh, I I <laughs> I, uh, I just. Uh, I can't explain to you what it's like to be on the outside looking in because these gals, and I'm talking about all of them, are spectacular. Do you want to just kind of maybe just temporarily in, 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 introduce them or give me, a, give me a take on what the staff is really like at AAKP? Sure. So uh, first of all, it's probably unusual for some organizations, but our entire staff are uh, women and they're professionals and uh, they are mission focused. And um, so in terms of a workforce, we have a diverse workforce, um, but they are all women executives. Uh, they are all very focused on um, working in harmony uh, across their skill sets uh, and their duplicative skill sets to a degree. And they're also unique, makes them a very powerful force individually and as a team. And uh, I can tell you this, that um, I'm a former chief of staff of the US Department of Labor and a former chief of staff of the United States Civil Service. And one of the things that you want to hire for is you want to hire for mission focus and mission dedication. And we've lucked out. Uh, we have professionals who have given their lives in service to patients as professionals. And that is unique. It's not just a job to them, it's a mission. And they literally work around the clock. And um, uh, they are among the finest professionals I've ever served with. Uh, Diana Kleins, our executive director. Uh, Aaron Cayley, who's uh, come in from the National Kidney Foundation with a good sense of humor and total patient focus. Uh, we have Jennifer uh, Raid, who's a, and Jen's uh, on the communications team, and she leads that effort across social and press. Um, just uh, Val. Val Gonzalez, who... yeah. You know, uh, as board members, she knows how to corral us because we're half crazy. We're she's just and cats. Patient. She's so very patient with us. Yeah. And um, so for the for the entire team, uh, from the top on down and, and across, um, just total respect for patients, total focus on mission and delivery. They they tell me a lot of the times they, they put me on to this whole thing. And that's as you know, here at AAKP, we got one thing in mind, and that's the patient. Yeah. Have no other focus, have no other uh, desire, but to serve the patient. And then it's all free. You can become a member of this organization, AAKP, for nothing. You don't uh, even. What, it's, it's one of the things, you know, uh, back when we redid the strategy in 2016, um, uh, we were looking na nationwide at organizations. A lot of them were still um, of old school like membership based, you have to pay X amount for yeah. us to service you. And uh, to be honest with you, I always thought that was kind of ass backwards, especially <laughs> in the age of social media, because you should have zero barriers, one click and you're in. And really what that means is no barrier to education for those people whose lives are at risk. And then our job as board members and as professional staff is to leverage the funding and get the grants so that more and more patients can get the information. So we kind of changed the dynamic a bit on that. And uh, we're very proud of that. <laughs> well, there, uh, it's glaringly evident that they all grasp it and including, including the, uh, the upper group in the, in, on the board and, uh, you know, Ed and, and you and Richard. And I can tell you one thing for sure. The whole emphasis is on one thing and that's patient. All right. Now that's patient focused, patient centered, a lot like we are kidney solution. The key here is choice. All right. Yes. I want you to speak. And we, we were in a meeting the other day and we hit really hard on this. And this is what it's all about, folks. I want to pay really close attention to this. Every patient has a right and an obligation to seek that right to make sure that they get all the information they need. All right. Before they make their decision. This is not a decision about coming from a physician. It's not coming from a family member, coming from you, regardless, regardless of how, quote, sick you are at the moment, you have the right to make the decision. 
And they have the obligation, the medical community, to give you the options. Am I clear, clear on that, Paul? You, you, you are crystal clear like a piece of Waterford on the table. You bet. And let me tell you why, okay? Um, this is your life. This is your future. And this is the key to your aspirations. Everything that you've ever wanted to do circles around your health. So you are the decision maker. And Kent, you hit it absolutely right. The medical profession is there to provide expert advice, but you must insist that you make the call. So you have an obligation to learn, to find out what you need to ask, and the medical professional has the obligation to work with you. But hospitals and insurers, all those people can impact the trajectory of your life, but that's why it's fundamentally important to keep asserting your right to decide the treatments that align with your aspirations. And that's what we fight for at AAKP. That's what you fight and educate for um, through the podcast. But a lot of people don't understand how serious that is. And they'll like to say, well, the hospital is the biggest consumer of healthcare. Sorry, no, they're a third party. So is your insurance company. They're a third party. It is your life. It's your decision. Grab a hold of it, manage it and own it. And don't ever let anyone else tell you what you do or try to limit your choice or your life. It's wrong. It is wrong. It's totally wrong because we're the one, and it's not about money, about who's paying the bill. What it is, is about the basic significant right that you have as a human being to decide what it is they are going to do to you, what they ought to do to you, but what options are given to you. If you don't have any options, you're not learned, and you're going to make some bad decisions. All right. And relying upon your family or others to make those decisions for you, that doesn't fly. It's up to us. We're the ones, patients, the Pauls and the Kents and the, you know, anybody who has this disease owes it to themselves to make sure they do everything possible to get options, gain the options, and then seek good counsel to make decisions. You're not a standalone thing. No, it's uh, you started the podcast with a prayer and a blessing. And so let's just think about that for a second, okay? Um, We're all reflections of our maker. And we've all been imparted with a mind and an intellect. And when you have a mind and an intellect, you have responsibility. And you have responsibility for your life and the life of others. So it just doesn't make any sense in a healthcare analysis or in a diagnosis that you would not be aggressive and take a hold of your ability to learn and discern and make good decisions. And you have many partners along that way. You have advocates like us, you have healthcare professionals, but at the end of the day, you have a moral obligation to live. And in order to do that, you need to educate yourself. It's it's that clear. So you start with a prayer, we educate you up, You have the strength and you have the ability to make a decision. Don't ever let anyone kind of act as though you as a patient aren't smart enough to make your own decisions. That's just not true. That's not true. Not true at all. You you become smart when you get information. You get smart when you get educated and you get really damn smart when you got kidney disease, right? Oh, absolutely. And then then you end up on a podcast. You don't know what the next question is going to (laughs) be. It's been pretty easy, though, so far. Because you're going to fit right in no matter what I ask you. Listen, that was one of the questions I was going to I was going to pose is how AAKP represents the kidney patient, the individual patient, not the the groups. You know, not, how does how does AAKP stand up with the Kent Bresslers and the you know the the Paul Conways of the world? How do they do that? So so we do it at a couple of levels. Uh, one, obviously, we have a, a patient majority, overwhelming majority uh, board of directors that's diverse, brings a lot of different perspectives, a lot of different disease stages. Uh, Then what we have is we have a fantastic ambassador program uh, that is put together by our professional staff. Aaron heads that up. And uh, that has hundreds of patients involved in it from all over uh, the country, from all walks of life. And they also give us direct representation, uh, not just through the people they meet, but the people that they engage with on social media. And then we have a very big social media presence. So we're always listening as much as we're posting and sending things out on social media, we're analyzing what's being talked about. Um, And then what we do is we do a massive amount of uh, very good, high quality surveying. Absolutely. 
constantly trying to get that drumbeat and that pulse of what's going on in the community and engage that opinion and then take that opinion to Capitol Hill, to federal agencies, to the White House across multiple administrations. And we're trusted because we're very large and they know we're very sophisticated in our technologies. And so we can bring those insights in real time uh, to decision makers and uh, get that patient opinion across. Also, the the camaraderie that you have with p- groups like George Washington uh, University. I mean, that that's always amazed me how easy it is for us to drift in and out of that that uh, climate, so to speak. You know, they they're all in on everything that we're doing, and we're all in on their you know their expertise. A tremendous amount of great things that go on. Um, it, tell us a little bit on the national level what 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 programs uh, AAKP offers, like the you know the the uh, uh, summits that we do and the uh, uh, different types of programs. Sure. So um, at any given time, uh, you can go onto AAKP's website. We have a tremendous uh, library of uh, webinars, and uh, just on COVID alone over the past two years, I think we have at least now two dozen or more. Uh, very specific COVID webinars with some of the world's best experts, literally. Absolutely. How to protect yourself, learn about the disease. And it takes you away from kind of the headline news and gives you the facts. And we trust you can make your own decision, but these are really top line professionals. And then we have in that same uh, course of materials, these are all free. We have printed materials, multi-language materials, and webinars on all aspects of kidney disease. Um, We have national events. We have three primary national events that we do. Uh, We do a global summit every year. This is our fourth year coming up for that. uh, That has patients uh, in over 80 countries, patients and professionals in over 80 countries, over 20,000 folks engaged in that last year. Uh, We have an annual policy meeting in midsummer that kind of gets into the nuts and bolts of how policy is made in Washington, you know, the big sausage factory. But it's interesting because people come to that summit and they lay out specific barriers or hopes for innovation and change for how we're gonna uh, better suit patients around the country. And then we have uh, our annual meeting, which when we're out of the COVID environment is the largest patient meeting in the United States, but now we're doing the largest patient meeting in the United <laughs> States. Uh, Virtually. Online, yeah. And, uh, and, and we have <laughs> chat rooms. This year it's gonna be on steroids in terms of the experience you can have. You know, you can. You get points for doing different things online. There's a leaderboard, uh, but it's a lot of a lot of education. You can kind of a la carte and pick your own course. If you're early in kidney disease, you want to learn more about transplant. You want to figure out how to leave a dialysis center and do dialysis at home. You have a huge menu of uh, educational choices you can choose from. And then we put all that out live on the day of, and then we film it professionally with Jonathan St. John, our oh yeah expert. And uh, all that material then goes out and is available a la carte uh, post event as well. See, those are all national things too. You know, things that go on within the U.S. that uh, other people are invited to globally, and that yeah. brings us then to uh, just the. Oh, I, I know what I wanted to say. With that's uh, aakp.org, org, aakp dot org. Pretty simple to remember. I can even do that. Yep. All right. and, and you can also find us on uh, Twitter and Facebook at, at everywhere. At, yeah. At kidney patient and at kidney patients with an S on the end of it. Yeah. We'll get you into the social media platforms, but yeah, on the website, you can find pretty much everything that you need. Yeah. I get a, a big kick out of, of cruising through there. There's a lot of things on there. A lot of people I see in some of the pictures, you know, they're you know, <laughs> aggressively great. So we do, we, it's a great website. I mean, it's, it's not busy. You know, a lot of websites are real busy. You know what I'm saying? You jump from here, jump there. Everything's pretty much one click with aakp.org. So go there, learn about dive, you know, all, all the aspects of kidney disease. And then some of the people you can, you can hook on. Uh, there's uh, lots of information on that, on that site. Okay. You so can, you can even see a picture of you at the signing of the executive order of it, on advancing American kidney health with the president it, of the United States. Think about yeah. That. <laughs> yeah, and 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 Ed to, Ed to boot. So there you go. <laughs> Listen, that was a great time. I really enjoyed that. I really appreciated the invite to to be able to do that too. Uh, that was monumental. And there's still things coming out of there, uh, left and right. That's an that's a that's a point well served. Um, 
Okay, so what I wanted to slip into is now your new role. You're a, you know, you're kind of like the global superintendent. I call him, you know, you're <laughs> you're the one. People get called in your office. They're the superintendent, not the principal. You're the the main the main dog on this on this project. Let explain the global concept that AAKP has. Sure. So um, this all started uh, our our efforts uh, worldwide uh, started through. A series of telephone calls we've gotten over the course of 10 or 15 years from people in other countries wanting to learn more about kidney disease. And so we, we knew there was a desire for more information out there. But I had an opportunity to participate in 2018 in a meeting at the United Nations on the burden of kidney disease uh, and its connection to end of life decision making. And I was a patient on the panel. It was a tremendous invitation. It came from uh, Dr. Barry Smith from the Rogerson Institute, who's also now on our board. But in listening to some of the other presenters, it was, to me as a patient, pretty depressing because essentially what some of the narrative was is that all these patients, they put an undue burden on the health system and, you know, they have unrealistic expectations about living and <laughs> we need to educate them on what reality is. And so I'm sitting there as an AKP president, thinking of all the things you're doing in innovation to help people make better decisions to stay alive longer. And here I'm listening to this dribble about, oh, the burden on health systems. Well, you know something, we're Americans. We don't settle for that. Nope. Our goal is to drive innovation. And I was just thinking, you know something, this is ridiculous. I know all these patients out there through AKP around the world that wanna be part of creating more innovation and living longer. So. Coming out of that, I talked to Richard, I talked to Ed, I talked to Diana and uh, other members of the board and said, hey, let's offer an optimistic vision of the world. And so we're kind of kicking that around. And then I ended up in the hospital. And I was at George Washington Hospital. Yeah. My, my doctor came in uh, and uh, he, he sat down on the bed and said, you know, hey, you're going to be fine. Basically, I was scared he was sitting there. And, he, and then he said, uh, what, what, how do you want to collaborate? Let's do something together. And that's Dr. Uh, Dominic Raj. Think, yeah, Raj. Yeah. And, that, and that's how we hatched uh, the AAKP Global Conference and uh, anchored it at George Washington. And now we have people from all over the world. And the most interesting thing is we have a consortium of patient groups around the world now coming together um, who are going to be more engaged in their countries, advancing policy and innovation. It's very optimistic. It's a long way from the UN. And I'm glad. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm, I mean, it's it again, it just goes down to the AAKP face side it's patient focused i mean can't, go figure out you can't imagine anything better than being patient focused can you tell me one thing that's better than that i, I can't you, you know um can you you've been really aggressive and vocal about anchoring it on the patient and to those who are who are following you and listening to you i have to tell you that kent is a voice of clarity and a voice of wisdom in a forest of a lot of other sounds. But it's that simple. It comes down to what is best for the patient. And that's what the world should circulate around. And when we find planets that don't operate like that, we kind of take them off their axis and bring them back to reality, which is the patient. And it's a pleasure to do it. Well, that's, that's an obligation that we're required to do that. If you leave somebody out there in their own orbit, Without any help, without any mentorship, without anybody listening to them, where do they go? They just go off into the black hole, right? They go off to the black hole, and they may not know that they have certain choices and certain options. And Absolutely. then somebody, somebody else starts making the decisions for them because they'll substitute their judgment because they'll look at the patient and they'll think either, one, they're too old, they don't understand, uh, there's, no way they could, they, there's no way they could deal with the burden of disease. So right. what happens is when you're not aggressive in your own care and care is not centered on the patient, other people's subjective reasoning and judgments substitute for your own. And that's where things get pretty dicey. Yeah. And they uh, get very, they get very fluid, but the wrong kind of fluid, right? It just does <laughs> not, it, it's not the fluid that flows downhill. It's the fluid that becomes <laughs> static and becomes accessible. So my, <laughs> my point has always been Give a person all the information they need and le let them make the decision. Because if they make, quote, the wrong decision after counseling, you don't have to do that then. 
you you're obligated to give them and let them make that information. We've dwelt about it. Let them make their own decisions. And I, you know what? I think probably a large percentage of the time, the, the answer that the, it comes back is always right on the patient's side. That's all, all there is to it. Yeah, it, it is that easy. Sometimes from a policy perspective, and this is why, you know, on the serious side of AKP and Kent knows this well, have been on our board and uh, reviewing a lot of the policy. We will actually engage in uh, the defeat in efforts to defeat bad legislation here in Washington, D.C. Absolutely. That undermines the patient's right to choose when they get transplanted, if they want to do home care, um, because there are some forces that are out there uh, being realistic, economic forces, companies and other things that would find it easier from a business standpoint to control what a patient has access to or not, because they are responding to their investors or their shareholders. Yes, a- exactly. We respond to patients. That's and that that takes you right back to where AAKP stands. Period. Yeah. And other people can say, you know, well, you know, it's all about patients. Well, no, in some cases it's not. But in this case with AAKP, it always is. There's always a scenario that allow that allows us to help, all right, mentor, not demand or predict or try to force someone into something, but we give them the option. Once the option's there, we guide them. If they make a decision, then we're there to help them with it. Never leave them. We don't abandon patients. Abandoning patients is not what this is all about, regardless of their status. Name a lot of people that I know who no longer can be transplanted. Yeah. Then, and think about that, Paul. Think yeah. about that. Not having yeah. an option. like and, and so do we then just say, well, you know, They'll be all fine. They'll be fine. No, that it, we dig in, and that's when we really go to work to help them yeah, and protect we get, them. We get into the details of policies. Um, uh, about ten years ago, there was a policy that was being put forth by the federal government to restrict uh, access to some of the drugs that allow people to keep a high uh, and healthy uh, blood cell count uh, right. to fight anemia. And w- in the course of one of these public meetings, I was sitting with Doctor. Uh, Stephen Fatum, who's our chair of our medical advisory board. And I was there to give public testimony in favor of this therapy uh, because when I had uh, been on dialysis, I needed iron supplements. I needed anemia. Oh, sure, sure. I was the deputy secretary of health in Virginia, you know, running around like a crazy person trying to keep my job. And Dr. Fatum turned to me and said, you know, if, if you don't have access to this drug, do you know what you would have to do, Paul? And I said, well, they told me that my other option would be transfusion. And he looked at me and said, that's what I'm going to testify about. Because if patients get transfusions, they may be shutting the door on Absolutely. their transplant. And the shocking thing to me, Kent, was no federal official nor medical person except for our Stephen Fatum made that point. So I had the pleasure of doing it as a patient with my doctor friend, Stephen Fadum, the chair of our medical advisory board, the two of us hammered that point home that the only voice that wasn't being represented in that room was the voice of the person who might someday want to get a transplant that and won't be able to policy. They wouldn't be able to. You bet. Yep. yep. And that those, that's the main thrust here for this whole conversation is you, yeah, it's all about patients, but it's also about patients who've kind of like number one reached end of life issues number one. Number two, have the inability to progress to the best forms of uh, renal transplant or uh, renal replacement therapy. There's no options. They've run out of options, all right, except good patient care and acknowledging the fact that AAKP acknowledges the fact that patient care is the most important thing for folks. That's it. It's all about patient care. You you talked about uh, our friend Ed Hickey, who's the vice president. (laughs) Let me tell you a real quick story for folks who uh, Ed has been on your show, but Ed is the vice president of AAKP. He's the chair of the Veterans Health Initiative. And in his background, he was a U.S. Marine uh, infantry officer, and he was also a uh, a member of staff. He he was an administrative assistant, the chief of staff on Capitol Hill, and he worked for uh, two presidents. Ed recently took a look at some research uh, that was being put out. It was an article that was coming out in C. Jason. And uh, he called me up and he said, you know something, I got a bad feeling about this. Let's write an editorial. And the research that was coming out 
was taking a look at patients that had been um, hit by COVID and that had acute kidney injury. And essentially what this research was saying is these people cost a lot of money. A lot of them are going to die. So why don't we go ahead and start a new standard, which is that for acute kidney injury, when you are diagnosed with that, we want to immediately start a conversation about palliative care. And that's okay, but what the authors were really driving at was let's start end of life care. They were mischaracterizing palliative. So Ed and I did this editorial where we took a look at it. And these researchers looked at a database of patients. They never talked to a patient. They got no patient insight data. Um, and they recognized the weakness of their research in their writing, but they still said, and this is the key thing, they said our hope and our aspirations, that was their word, as authors of this research, is that this model be adopted system-wide across the United States. Yeah. And so we objected to that because it had no patient information, no patient insight in it. And if you're sitting there in a hospital fighting to stay alive or your loved one, do you really want hospital people coming up and saying, hey, by the way, they have acute kidney injury, uh, they may not live, and we're gonna go ahead and put them into a program uh, that's kind of withdrawing care. And that was the implication of what they were writing. And so we did a very strong editorial against that and said, for anybody that wants to consider that, you need to actually get some patient insight data into your research. And we're proud that we did that. Yeah, and, and that's, that's essentially the point. As a matter of fact, you don't have obligations, you don't have opportunities unless you have patient focused abilities for them to say things, to be, to sit on the board, to sit on the panel, to say to the researchers that, uh, you know what, we haven't done anything in 50 years. And now in the last seven to 10 years, we've got a multitude of things. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Because this is a struggle, this kidney disease. I don't care what diagnosis you're carrying. Kidney disease is not one thing. It's a multitude of things. And those multitudes of things do not allow you a lot of leniency or gravity to progress. So why take the hope away? Once you do that, you take the hope away. What else is there? That's in all honesty, you already have one of the worst, if not the ninth leading cause of death in the world. You've been strapped with that. And yeah. they're going to, the last thing they're going to do is take away your hope. Yeah, no, this, this no, is why I don't I, think so. It's, it's why I can't, you know, you're optimistic. And uh, you, like, again, you know, you started with prayer and we talk about the people that we honor. And so things like faith, honor, principle, and people is essentially what medicine should circulate around. And when it doesn't, other judgments are made and people are denied. Um, access to information, they're denied treatment choices, and their life becomes truncated. And that's, that's what we've sought to reverse. We've done a good job over the past 10 years. It's a very optimistic now, but it, it requires constant vigilance. So folks oh, that are sure, sure, you know, Paul. Get, get, get involved, get involved. <laughs> yep, and, and stay involved. Engage, don't disengage, and especially don't disengage if you're, quote, pissed off. Don't disengage. Stay engaged all the time, all right? Learn from everybody around you and then impart knowledge that you know has been vetted and is right, okay? But in all, in all honesty, this organization has focused on the patient and they will continue to stay focused on the patient. And you can take that to the bank. Agreed? I, I would call that the Bank of Kent. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean... We're lucky. So we, we have a chance to live and educate and uh, everybody has that opportunity to do that. And yeah, it, it, you know, some days it can be really frustrating. You know, you and I both know that Ken. You, know, you, you can really struggle, but then you got to ask yourself, okay, if it's difficult for me today, imagine what it's like for people that are on their own. So, Ooh. okay, I'm going to take that frustration and put it into something positive. What, what about the hundred thousand or so, you know, that are waiting, the waiting game, Kidneys, kidney disease is like a waiting game. I've asked many times my friends and my patients that I work with, please take the waiting game out of your situation. Don't use that term. Yeah. Be aggressive and work 
to make sure that you get your end result. Waiting is shouldn't be in your vocabulary. It doesn't yeah, exist. So, so the so the federal government has a thing called um, the Oregon uh, waiting list. Yeah, and waiting guess, list. Okay, and so let's just say government does some some things really well and some things not, and they create labels and structures for things, which is what they're supposed to do. But that label of waiting, uh, no, take the initiative is what Kent's saying. And in each of our cases, we had to do the hard job of picking up the phone, talking to family members putting ourselves out there, reminding our doctors that we were staying safe, reminding our doctors we were being consistent, asking them when a kidney was going to come. And you really got to stay educated, keep yourself safe, uh, keep yourself uh, vaccinated, you know, and, and in good form, eat right, keep your weight down and uh, your heart checked out. Do all those things is a huge job, but you got to be proactive. You can't sit around and wait. Sorry, but you know, wait, Wait is a term that the government applied to a list. Exactly. Wait is not what you do as a patient. <laughs> That's right. You can't. So it's got to be eliminated. Mm -hmm. You'll go to the doctor's office as an example. Let's watch this. We're just going to watch this. That's the second word. Waiting and watching should be eliminated from our vocabulary. Watching does you no good. It, if you've got a doc that's going to just watch it, there are certain things that maybe need to be observed but to watch it doesn't exist. You have to, you have to go find somebody who's not going to watch. It's going to get aggressive and figure it out at least give you the options then to say, here's the renal, renal uh, replacement therapy options that you have. Cause in my book, I don't think we have many more options than transplant or dialysis or death. I don't, I don't see any other options. Do you? No, you don't. I mean, if you do absolutely nothing, you will die. That's a reality when you have kidney failure. I mean, let's, and if you know it's coming and you're predisposed to it, you must act. So uh, there is a positive light here. Um, so for those Americans who want to get a transplant, um, on the horizon line, you will see artificial implantable organs, artificial wearable organs, and tremendous work has been done in the past several years by Dr. Robert Montgomery up at New York Langone Hospital on uh, xenotransplants, which is exactly editing out the genes of a, a pig organ and then making it so that your body can sustain that. And I think we're on the verge of that in the next several years of all these things. I was approached and was very fortunate to be part of this, you know, xeno, what I call it, xenophobe. We're really working hard on this on this project. And somebody says, how can you do that? I can even think about it. Pig, pig kidney or pig heart. Or, and I said, well, what other options do you have? If you, if you, the old term thinking out of the box, this isn't out of the box thinking. This is standard thinking and a process and a road that they can fix things, right? And, you know, in medicine, as well as I do, you know, things don't move fast. Matter of fact, they do snail space. You think government's bad. Medicine's even worse, right? Been yeah. looking for treatments for FSGS for over 50 years. And now in the last five, we've got multitudes for nephrotic syndrome, multitudes of med medications, tons of research. Open up the doors of research. You opened up life. A hundred percent. It's why we fight for funding. You know, those, some of these things are kind of easy to do. So, we push for legislation and for appropriations on Capitol Hill so more funds can come into research. But what Kent, you just outlined here, Kent, was uh, there is no sense of urgency like there is with a patient. And that's why it has been very, very important in the past 10 years to put patients at the table as co-researchers and as co-investigators and co-authors because we add to the doctor and to the researcher and to the authors, the sense of urgency that they can only read about. That's right. So if you're writing a paper on, in a medical journal that says, you know, I am hopeful that in the next 60 months, we may see the formation of a preliminary clinical trial. You kind of tap the person on the shoulder, pick them up on a Zoom call and say, hey, I just had three friends that I lost in the past 12 months. You think we can take 60 down to 12? What does yeah, it take please. to do that? Yeah, because five, five people, five to 13, depending on what numbers you look at, die every day just waiting on a kidney. That's exactly right. So, so 
and and less than twenty dollars is spent per person per year on research for kidney disease. Yeah, where does that get you when you look at thing like HIV? I think got three thousand to thirty five hundred dollars per patient per year. A lot of disparity between twenty and thirty five hundred. But we're not complaining. No, I'm not complaining. I'm just saying, where's the parity? Let's look at it because there are a lot of people in the black and brown community that don't get the access that they need and and the research dollars. It's even more important for them because they die from this kind of disease process at a much higher rate than the rest of us. You know, I'm glad you brought this up because here's the irony of this. If you take a look at the spending in other diseases, um, HIV, uh, cancer, issues like that, um, it is uh, much, much higher as a proportion in terms of what is spent. So we always view that as a performance metric of the advocacy efforts in those fields. And for a long time in the kidney field, uh, patients were not at an equivalent level with doctors. I think what they kind of discovered in the past 10 or 15 years is that the secret formula to this is doctors and patients together going to the Capitol Hill to talk to your elected officials to get more appropriations. And that that little amount that we've been able to increase it over the past 10 years has produced major results in innovation. And we were just up last week with the American Society of Nephrology, uh, 90 patients and doctors, uh, actually 50 patients and doctors did 90 congressional meetings in less than eight hours. And one of the asks that we had for that was a near doubling of any appropriations we've ever asked for before for the National Institutes of Health. There were $623 million um, for that effort. And that, even if we get half of it, will be a massive increase for NIH. And then you can draw a line to where you're going to see innovations that come within three or four years after that. Absolutely. That's the kind of thing we got to do. That's right. And that's that's it has to happen all the time. That's yeah. not a wait for another year to come. You're doing that daily. You know, we talk about advocacy. Advocacy doesn't happen just on a day and one day a year. That's a constant, you know, it's a picking up your phone and calling your you know, congressional office and saying, hey, what about what about this bill? What about that bill? Have you looked at that? Have you think thought about co-sponsoring that bill? Is there an issue that you don't understand? Can I clarify that? But you don't do that once a year. Oh, no. You do that. You do the door wrapping on a whatever basis you want to do it, but it ain't yearly. All right. Weekly, maybe. I have a brother in Nebraska who calls his congressman once a month, regardless of, you know, but it's always has something to do with funding. Where is my dollar going? All right. Where is my dollar going? Is it going into fertilizer or moonshots or is it going into patients with kidney disease? Yeah. And, and here, here's something to always remember. So if you're talking about Congress or you're talking about your state legislature, your governor, <clears throat> the president, uh, they are public servants. What does that practically mean? They work for you. Absolutely. Bingo, yeah. bango. Yeah. It, you know, what, what, do you, what have you done for me lately? In all honesty, what is it that you've done? Can you list anything that you have done? Not talking points, not bullet points, uh, not answering questions, but what is it that you're doing for this kidney population? This ones that suffer, right? This disease process. And all they're asking for is a focus, right? Yeah, That's they all they're to, asking is to focus on kidney disease. And you've said to, it all. They, they need to hear from the people that are closest uh, to them, the people that elect them. It's actually one of the reasons why in 2018, uh, AAKP started uh, Kidney Voters. Yep. And uh, it is the largest and the only uh, full standing voter registration effort across the kidney community. Our goal for 2024 is 500,000 people that register to vote as kidney voters. We're well on our way to that. And that sends a signal not just to the Congress here in Washington, but also out to individual states and districts that there are people that not only view themselves as patients but they also view themselves as an organized voting block of patients that want more research and more innovation in the space. And it's a very powerful tool because when we meet with Congress, we let them know how many people in their state have registered as kidney voters. 
and what the implications of this bill or this policy are. So it just really kind of puts it in political clarity for elected leaders. You know something, Paul? Sometime we got to get together and talk about kidney disease. What do you say? <laughs> I think maybe at some point I could get down there to Texas. So you can teach me how to ride a steer and then we can talk about kidney injury. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I got a bed here for you. Bring it on. We've got plenty of room. And uh, I just want to thank you. I, I, I think this has been something that I've been waiting for a long time. And it's been uh, comfortable. I felt really comfortable with this whole situation. And I'm, I'm really appreciative of your candor and your knowledge and the ability to make sure that people understand this is all about the patient. hundred percent, Ken. I tell you what, you are a great educator. And uh, the folks that listen to your program, whether it's one program or multiple ones, um, a podcast delivers a lot of information and uh, you take it down. Uh, to a level that means something to people. And Thank you. It, we talk patients, and but you know something, you're connecting with people. And if people connect, then they'll listen. And you're doing a fantastic job at having people listen and learn. So thank you. Well, I, I appreciate you, Paul. I just want to tell my folks out here, there's no better place to be than with the kidney patient, especially if you have kidney disease. You know, at uh, kidneysolutions.org, ORG or whatever, all you got to do is tap that, tap that site, go in and look at all the things that are available to you because it's all free. And once you're in there, once you're in there and you see something wrong, give me a call right away. My number is the only number that's there and it's a 24 <laughs> seven, but sometimes I don't answer, but I always get back to you. And don't forget this. Just, just remember what my dad used to say. You don't have to do anything. The only thing you have to do is take care of yourself. Everything else will come right down the pike with you as long as you take care of yourself. So with that, Paul, thank you. And everybody out there, keep breathing.